seated. Thank you, Lloyd and Mason. Great pair. Good job. Love it. All right. Well, this morning we're going to continue. This is the last week of our Christmas series called The Christ of Christmas. Sermon title today is Mary, Did You Know? And the main text we're going to be in is Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. So where have we been? Before Christmas, we've been going through the book of Genesis on our foundation series. And then this Christmas, we've been using a classic Christmas tune and applying that to the Christmas message and the gospel and seeing the connection between the manger and the cross and even Jesus' second coming. And after Christmas, next week, uh, we're going to do a message on vision. What's the vision of Grace Community Fellowship? You will not want to miss that. And then we're going to go back to Genesis, and that'll take us to about June. So we have a lot more to cover in the book of Genesis, so I'm excited to get back there. But first, first in this message, our final message of the Christmas series, we've seen that most people in America, we hang Christmas decorations, we wrap presents, we sing songs like that, we exchange gifts on December 25th, we hang lights, all that stuff, wear hats have a lot of joy, but only one in five can provide all the details of the biblical Christmas account. Only one in five Americans. Well, what does this mean? Well, very few people actually know the Christ of Christmas, actually know the Christ of Christmas. And we've seen also in the past weeks, I've used this verse, but it just really hits home. Matthew 7, 13 through 14. Jesus himself confirmed this. He says, enter by the narrow gate, For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, there are few who find it. So as a church, we've been declaring the biblical account of the Christ of Christmas as we celebrate his birth. And again, we're going to continue to do that today in our final message on this series. So in this message... We're going to explore the uniqueness of Jesus' incarnation. There's a lot of quote-unquote mystery that surrounds this, but there shouldn't be. Scripture's very clear about what the incarnation is. So open up your Bibles if you have them. If not, you can listen. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. We're going to be camping out in this set of uh, texts today. So Luke chapter 1, verse 26 through 38. Let's read together. In the sixth month... The angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this in the sixth month with her who who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, as we open up your holy word and we read this most amazing account, Lord, there's often a lot of mystery surrounding this account. We thank you, Lord, for the clarity in your word, Lord, and the meaning of words. And Lord, what your word says in its original language, and Lord, how we can translate that into our language. And Lord, just see this amazing truth of what you are telling us about the birth of our Savior, and Lord, the, the, um, the incarnation. And then, Lord, as we look ahead to the manger, Lord, we see his birth. 
And Lord, as we remember, we can't have the manger without the cross. As Lord, we just thank you that you sent your only son to earth to die for us. But Lord, we are so grateful it didn't end there, Lord. He rose from the grave victorious and he's coming again, Lord. And we acknowledge that this morning. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you as we open your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so specific context. What's going on here in Luke chapter 1? Well, we saw here the angel Gabriel comes to Mary, a virgin who's engaged to a man named Joseph. Mary learns she's going to miraculously bear the Son of God to be named Jesus. And this will be the promised one, the long-awaited Messiah for the people of Israel. And Mary's inquiry to Gabriel said this, how will this be since I am a virgin? It's a very good question. And Gabriel's declaration to Mary, nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. So with that said, let's dive in and explore three themes in Luke chapter 1 regarding the very utter uniqueness of Jesus' incarnation. This is unbelievable stuff to dive into, so I'm psyched to get to this. So theme number one, the name. Theme number one, the name. Verse 31, look back. And you shall call his name, say it, <laughs> we can say it together, Jesus, yes. And you shall call his name Jesus. One theologian said this, it may be true that a rose by any other name would smell as sweet meaning a white rose, a red rose, a yellow rose, they all, they all smell very similar. He goes on, he says, but not so concerning Bible names, which often give keen insight into the lives of those who bear the titles. This is especially true concerning Jesus. A wealth of information concerning his person and work can be obtained from studying the names and titles ascribed to him. So in Hebrew, the name Jesus comes from the Hebrew work uh, who, Hebrew root meaning the Lord is salvation or Yahweh saves. So Jesus, the Lord is salvation or Yahweh saves. Jesus or literally Yeshua in Hebrew is a combination of Yah, which is an abbreviation for Yahweh, and the verb Yasha, meaning rescue or deliverer or save. Salvation is found in no other name than this Yeshua Acts 4.12 says this, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Forgiveness of sin is found in no other name. Acts 10.43, Everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Power is found in no other name. John 14.13, Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. One theologian made a resounding speech in 1976 to a Detroit, Michigan congregation regarding the uniqueness of this Jesus. He declared this powerfully. This is amazing stuff. Jesus is God's Son. He's the sinner's Savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He stands alone in Himself. He's dignified and He's unique. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He's supreme. He's preeminent. He's the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the supreme problem in higher criticism. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the core and necessity of spiritual religion. He says, that's my king. And then he goes on again. He's the only one able to supply all our needs simultaneously. He supplies strength to the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He's our guard and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the leopards, lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He rewards the diligent and he beautifies the meek. And then he says, do you know him? He says, well, I wish I could describe him to you, but he's indescribable. He's invincible. He's irresistible. The heaven of heavens cannot contain him, let alone a man explain him. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. He continues, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. 
death couldn't handle him and the grave couldn't hold him. And then he says, that's my king. And that's just a a short snippet of his speech. It is something. If you get a chance to look it up, just look up, that's my king speech, and it'll come up. So when our Beckaboo was really young, she wanted to change her name to Olive. We're not sure where Olive came from exactly, but Becca loves olives and always has, so perhaps that's the origin. But we had to explain to her when she was, again, really little, it's not like this happened yesterday, (laughs) but that we named her Rebecca on purpose. And Rebecca was her unique name. And if we were to change it to Olive, it wouldn't fit her because that's who she was. The significance of a person's name cannot be understated in Jewish culture. Here are just two examples of many in Scripture. The first human being was named Adam, which is derived from the Hebrew word Adama, meaning dust or dirt created by God. God actually used dust when he created Adam. So this is a very descriptive name for the name Adam. After creating the animals and birds, God brought them to Adam and whatever he called them, that became the creature's name. So a couple examples, again, many examples of this all throughout scripture. One rabbi said this, in Jewish history, a name has its own history and its own memory. It connects beings with their origins to retrace its path is then to embark on an adventure in which the destiny of a single word becomes one with that of a community. It is to undertake a passionate and enriching quest for all those who may live in your name. In fact, the Hebrew word for soul or or spirit, neshema, is derived from the Hebrew word for name, shem. So to further our point about how big a deal names are in Scripture, let's look at a couple of examples We'll look at them in a second, but one example in particular really hits the bell home. A misbehaving child. (laughs) Nothing grabs the attention of a misbehaving child more effectively than a parent calling them by their first, middle, and last name, right? You think names don't mean anything? I still shriek when I hear Jonathan Scott Barrett. It means I am in trouble. Nothing grabs my attention more than hearing my first, middle, and last name. So Jesus' names, are, Jesus's names are so unique, so powerful, that he's called many different names throughout Scripture to describe who he is as the Son of God. Jesus is the umbrella name of, his all, of all of his other names. But there's a few examples here that I want to go through just showing how powerful a name is. Jesus is called the Almighty in Revelation 1.8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come. The Almighty, he says. Jesus is also called the Christ, of course, in Matthew 2.4. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. Jesus is called the Deliverer, Romans 11.26. And in this way, all Israel must be saved, as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. Jesus is called the friend of sinners in Matthew eleven nineteen. They said derogatorily to him, Look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Jesus is called the high priest in Hebrews 3, 1. Therefore, holy brothers... You who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. Jesus is called the Holy One in Mark 1.24. The demon said this, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Even demons shriek at the name of Jesus. Jesus is called the Lion and the Lamb. Revelation 5.5. 5. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its eleven seals. The lamb in John 1.29. The next day, John says this, He saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Just a few more. I mean, there's, there's hundreds. <laughs> Jesus is called the Messiah in John 1.41. He first found his own brother, Simeon, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, 
Jesus is called the Savior in Luke 2.11. For unto you is born, is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And Jesus is called the Good Shepherd in John 10.11. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That's only, those are only 10 examples. But we also see this example back in our main text in Luke 1. Jesus is called the Son of the Most High back in verse 32. What does that mean? Well, it's very significant. Jesus is the son of Mary, but not only her son. Most high was a title for God used throughout the Old Testament. And in Hebrew, the equivalent to this, uh, to the Greek, the Hebrew equivalent to the Greek term used here by Luke is El Elyon, which is God most high. The title refers to God's sovereignty and the fact that no one is higher. Jesus being referred to as the son of the most high is to declare that he is the same essence as God most high. Jesus is 100% God and 100% man. Well, there's another example right in our main text. Jesus is called holy in verse 35. Well, as Messiah, the manner of Jesus' conception was wholly unique from all others in human history. Don't miss this part. The word overshadow used in verse 35 to describe the immaculate conception means literally to cover with a cloud, to cover with a cloud. It's the same word describing the Shekinah glory in the Old Testament and the cloud of transfiguration in the New Testament. And no, if you're wondering, the Holy Spirit did not mate with Mary. <laughs> he did not mate with Mary. Jesus is called the Son of God in verse 35. Well, what does this mean? This is an extremely important title. Jesus did not become the Son of God he was called the Son of God, recognizing his nature from all eternity. So our main point, the Christ of Christmas signifies perfection. So here's the second theme. It's the promise, the promise. In the Old Testament, King David, he was assured that someday an heir from his own seed would rule over Israel on his throne forever. 2 Samuel 7 and verses 16 through 17, talks about God's promise to David. It's called the Davidic covenant. I'll read a couple verses from it. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever in accordance with all these words and in accordance with all this vision. And this is the prophet Nathan speaking to David. Well, the Davidic covenant, that was fulfilled in Luke chapter 1 in our main text. Let's read it again. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. This is extremely significant in the scriptures when we see the Lord fulfilling this from the line of David. Jesus was the only one who could fulfill the Davidic covenant. Being the rightful heir as Messiah, from the line of David, Jesus was given the throne. Being the son of, the, uh, son of God most high, Jesus will occupy this throne forever. And then being the eternal son of God, Jesus' throne is an eternal throne. Even Peter spoke about Jesus fulfilling the Davidic covenant in Acts 2, verses 30 through 31. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, talking about David, that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. And this is Peter referring to David's Psalm 16, which is a messianic psalm. And we see the Apostle Paul speaking about it. He spoke about Jesus fulfilling the Davidic covenant. Romans chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Concerning his son, who was, a, was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Even John recorded Jesus' own words speaking about fulfilling the Davidic covenant. Re uh, Revelation twenty two sixteen, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. Well, as such, we can fully depend on Jesus as the ultimate promise keeper of our lives, now and for eternity. 
Hebrews chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, you and me, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We see again in John 1 John 2, 25, and this is the promise that he, speaking of Jesus, made to us, eternal life. We see it in John 14, 1 through 3, let not your hearts be troubled, believe in God, believe also in me, Jesus is speaking here. In my Father's house there are many rooms, if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. 2 Peter 1.4, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. And then here's one more example, Hebrews 9.15. Therefore he is the mediator of the new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Since a death has occurred that redeems from them the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Jesus is the promise keeper from of old, from eternity. So have you ever failed to keep a promise? Well, whether it's intentional or unintentional, I think we're all in the same boat here. I think we're all guilty as charged. Well, this shows how incredible and unfathomable It is that our Lord can never and has never broken a promise. As the angel Gabriel told Mary in our main text, nothing is impossible with God. That's what it means to be God, and he is. He can never break a promise because that's who God is. I remember one time I promised Sarah that I'd take out the kitchen garbage, and rather than just taking it to the dumpster, I decided to put it in my trunk and said I'd take it there in the morning. Well, I forgot, and it was summer. (laughs) Days went by, I could not figure out what that stench in my car was. I thought something died and got caught under the hood. Well, I just couldn't figure it out, seriously, no kidding. It wasn't until a week later that I finally remembered. I popped my trunk, and man, what a smell it was. Needless to say, I finally took that garbage to the dump. But that smell, it took a while for that to go away. And you see how easy it is for us to break even the littlest of covenants? The results can be very, very stinky. Well, Jesus is just the opposite. He is the covenant fulfiller and promise keeper. We see that, the heir of the throne of David. He came to fulfill that promise. All throughout Scripture, it speaks of that. Well, one popular contemporary Christian worship song goes like this, and you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. So he is God. That is who he is. So our main point, the Christ of Christmas, he signifies perfection. So the third theme is this, the standard, the standard. So verse 35, let's look back. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the son of God. Well, in New Testament times, a veil separated the holy of holies in the tabernacle. And it was only one day a year, the day of atonement, that the high priest was permitted to enter the holy of holies to make atonement for the people, for their sin on behalf of of God. Well, the tabernacle in the Old Testament was a type and shadow of Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of the tabernacle because he provided ultimate atonement for sin once and for all. Jesus doesn't have to keep dying on the cross. He did it once, and that was atonement for all. And as our great high priest, it was Jesus who tore the veil of sin once and for all. Matthew 27, 50 through 51. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks 
were split. But have you ever wondered, many, if many people reject Jesus as Messiah, and still do to this day, why were animal sacrifices of atonement stopped in the temple? It's a good question. Well, the answer is actually in the question. Animal sacrifices, they were stopped in 70 AD when Rome destroyed Jerusalem, and with it, the temple. And Jesus warned of this in the Gospels before it even happened. That was recorded in Mark 13. You see, Jesus turned the world upside down. His life changed everything. Quite literally, this is in fact. The entire world actually tells time by his life. B.C. means before Christ. A.D. means in the year of our Lord Jesus Christ in Latin. Even though the world has erased, for good, for good reason to say, A.D. and B.C. with before common era and after common era, it still means the same thing because the common era is Jesus' life. We literally tell time by his life. Every day you write the date or see it on your phone, that says Jesus. Additionally, the book of Hebrews shows that the Old Testament sacrificial system was a temporary institution until the first coming of Jesus. He fulfilled all that the sacrificial system anticipated. Hebrews chapter 9, 11 through 12. But when Jesus Christ appeared as the high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, has entered once and for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, that's talking about the Old Testament sacrificial system, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Today, when a Jewish Passover is observed, animal sacrifices are still unable to be offered because sacrifices are only to be offered in the Jerusalem temple. Prophetically, many theologians believe, as prophesied by Daniel, that the temple will be rebuilt and sacrifices will once again be offered because Jesus, as the Jewish Messiah, will continue to be rejected. However, these sacrifices will stop again. They will be stopped by the beast in Revelation chapter 13, as Jews will be persecuted until Jesus returns, which is when they will turn to him who they have pierced. This is as per the prophet Zechariah in Zechariah chapter 12. Well, Jesus, unblemished, pure, undefiled, perfect, and holy, the Son of God, he was the only one qualified to tear the veil of sin that separated mankind from God the Father. Jesus was and is the only one who could be the atoning sacrifice for sin. Hebrews 2.9, Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Jesus was and is the only one who could reconcile man to God. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 19. And this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was rec rec reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Jesus was and is the only one who could be our great high priest. Hebrews 3, 1, Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. Jesus is and was the only one who could set man free. Luke 4, 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind and set at liberty those who are oppressed. And Jesus was and is the only one who could give eternal life. This is the true message of Christmas. John 3, 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. One theologian said this, Jesus Christ is the standard and example, the pinnacle of all things a human should be. Not only was he sinless, he was also humble, meek, merciful, sacrificial, kind, encouraging, positive, and patient. When considering what he was in his total personality for the purpose of comparing ourselves to him, we need to recall Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
none of us measures up to his standard of perfection in any area. In fact, the Greek word for sin, it's an archery term, meaning missing the mark. Sin is not just making an error in judgment, not just goofing in a particular case, but missing the whole point of human life, which is unbroken fellowship with our Creator. Sin is not just the violation of God's perfect moral law, but an insult to a relationship with the one to whom we owe everything, our very lives. The only answer for mankind who misses the mark completely is found in none other than Jesus, the Son of God. It doesn't matter how hard you try. If you don't know Christ, the morality runs out at some point. And what point of reference do you have for morality if it's not with Jesus? Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. We, nobody can escape that one. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. God determined even before Adam sinned in the garden and this present evil world was founded that through Jesus, the sinless Lamb of God, He would be sacrificed for the sin of mankind and we would be able to be forgiven through that sacrifice. The Christ of Christmas, He signifies perfection. So let's apply all of this. In Luke 1.38 of our main text, after the angel Gabriel visited Mary to proclaim that she would bear a son and he would be the prophesied Messiah, here is her final reaction. Mary said this, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Fast forwarding to the manger. Have you ever stopped to wonder what was going through Mary's head that Christmas morning over 2,000 years ago. Jesus' birth is one of the most precious scenes in the biblical Christmas account. A singer, a Christian singer, was inspired to write Mary Did You Know after listening to a Christmas sermon in 1984. Here's a portion of the lyrics. Mary, did you know that your baby boy is Lord of all creation? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day rule the nations? Did you know that your baby boy is heaven's perfect lamb? That sleeping child you're holding is the great I am. The singer was captivated by how Mary, being fully aware of Jesus' divinity, could have pondered the vastness and significance of it all. And the central theme of the song revolves around the question of whether Mary truly understood the magnitude of her son's arrival. As a God-fearing woman, imagine the awe and wonder she must have felt as she held the newborn Jesus. We're gonna have we're gonna have Emily come up whenever you're ready. Putting a bow on this message, considering the uniqueness of Jesus' incarnation, let's pose another question for you instead of Mary. So let's insert your name here. Insert your name. Do you know? Do you know? As we sing this song, think about this. Does your life constitute awe and wonder at such an amazing God who was born to die for you? As you listen to the lyrics of this song, and just in your mind's eye, think about this. Think about what Mary could have been thinking. That's a question for you and me today. What are we thinking? What are we going to do with this Jesus, with this holy Son of God? Does your life constitute awe and wonder at such an amazing God who is born to die for you? The Christ of Christmas signifies perfection. Thank you, Emily and John. Puts it in perspective, doesn't it? Well, in today's message, as we start to close here, we saw three themes in Luke chapter 1 regarding the uniqueness of Jesus' incarnation. We saw the first theme, the name. In Hebrew, we saw that the name Jesus comes from the Hebrew root word, meaning the Lord is salvation or Yahweh saves. Jesus, or literally Yeshua in Hebrew, is a combination of Yah, in abbreviation for Yahweh, and the verb Yasha meaning rescue, deliverer, or to save. Jesus was named Jesus intentionally. 
This was no accident. His name wasn't picked in a baby book. This was his name from all eternity. The second theme we saw, the promise. The Davidic covenant, a really big deal in the scriptures, assured King David that someday an heir from his own seed would rule over Israel on his throne forever. And that prophecy, that was fulfilled by Jesus, Yeshua. As such, we can depend on Jesus, who is the ultimate promise keeper of our lives, both now and for eternity. And then the third theme was the standard. The sacrificial system, the tabernacle, Old Testament, it was a type and shadow of Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of the tabernacle. He provided atonement, atonement for our sin on the cross, and he tore that veil once and for all. He is our great high priest. And then we sang, Mary, did you know? Considering the uniqueness of Jesus' incarnation, how about you? How about you? Do you know? Do you know? Does your life constitute awe and wonder at such an amazing God who was born to die for you and for me? Wow. That is the message of Christmas. The Christ of Christmas signifies perfection. Perfection. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your servants singing Mary, did you know? What a great song. We thank you that the songwriter was so moved by a message he heard in church and wrote that song. It's amazing to ponder it. And we can't even begin to fathom what Mary was thinking. But Lord, just her response, be it done to me, I'm a servant of the Lord. Whatever you say, she said. Wow, <laughs> what a great example for us to follow. Whatever you say, Lord, whatever you say. And as we listen to that song, Lord, to ponder, what about us? Who do we say that you are in our lives? Lord, just, Lord, in our existence as we go about our days, Lord, are you the Lord of our lives? Lord, we thank you for you. We thank you that you are the great I am as that song finishes up and declares. What a great ending to the song. So Lord, we thank you that you are the great I am, Lord. We thank you for your word and, Lord, the declaration of Christmas and what that meant. Not just some cute little baby born in a manger, but, Lord, you, the sinless Son of God, coming from all eternity and being humbly born in a manger for us. Lord, we deserve the manger. We deserve hell and punishment for all eternity. But Lord, you endured that for us. And Lord, as we look to your second coming, let's not forget that as part of the Christmas message. You will come again, Lord, to reign. Lord, so we look forward to that. But in the meantime, Lord, we have plenty of work to do. Lord, just in submitting ourselves to you, Lord, and loving you and making you known to this world that so desperately needs the light of Christmas. So Lord, as we go from here, Lord, help us to remember that and shine that light all throughout this area, Lord, through Pennsylvania, through our country, and through the world. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Merry Christmas.